So moving into the second key concept for skill acquisition, um, which is our fifth topic. So looking at specific factors affecting, learn affecting learning. So this will look at the first three key ideas, which is the nature of the task, practice and feedback and environmental factors, the intended student learning of being understanding simple complex skills and the rate of learning of the methods of the teacher skill, teaching of the skill, um, the recognizing the different types of practice and when best to use them and recognizing the different settings that learners operate in. So when we're breaking down what a task actually is, we've got to ask ourselves, is it a simple or complex task? Is it an open and closed task? And we can see here the factors that are associated with those. So, you know, if we're looking at an open skill, we're looking at an unpredictable environment, there's external factors, um, is it a controlled environment, etc. If it's a closed skill, we're looking at that self-paced, um, predictable environment that we can work with. Um, same with the simple and the complex skill, whether it's a fine skill or where there's um, lots of procedures involved in it. So we can see here the model um, of the optimal learning zone. So um, if the challenge is too great, we can see the anxiety and the worry about performance comes in and what that'll do is it'll affect the learning in a negative way. Um, if the challenge is too low, for example, the boredom and the frustration also affects performance where we become lethargical so you can have a negative impact, impact on the performance. And we can see that there's an optimal zone. So a mixture between um, a challenge um, but not too challenging. So we also, if we have that challenging task, we need to um, construct the task as a gradual le level of development as seen below so we can work through the stages of learning. So we now make sure the challenge is progressive. Um, each step allows for that development of a suitable, at a suitable level um, and so we can actually achieve that higher level of competence. Um, the key to ensure progressions are to make sure that we're meeting the suitable needs of each level of learner. So what's an example of how the task can influence the performance or learning? So we can uh, a hard task depends on the skill task being undertaken plus the ability of the learner and then we can see the outcome of the success of the learning or performance. So if a task is difficult in relation to the level of learning, the learning and performance will always be affected. So here we can see um, the factors that can have an impact on the difficulty of a task, so the cognitive de demands, the safety concerns, the physical demands, and the motor demands. So if we've got a task that, that does not meet the physical demands of the student, straight away that will bring a negative impact on the performance. If a, if a subject is worried about the safety, straight away it'll be um, a negative impact on the performance. So we're gonna take all those things into consideration. So we can see here a bit of a case study look in relation to the learner. So there's three different activities. So drill one, two, and three, we can see progressively drill one has a player just giving 10 shots at goal from three meters. Drill two involves um, a second skill, so catching the ball and then shooting. And drill three um, has um, receiving the ball, then passing to player C, and then having a more complex movement. So if we're looking at the drill most suited to a beginner, we're looking at probably drill one. Um, and the reason for that being is the lowest perceptual demands. It's easy to do because it's simple, few things to think about. And if we're looking back at the previous concepts, we only have to take in one stimulus. We don't have to worry about the second or the variety of skills. It's just performing that one basic skill. So explain why the beginner could not do um, drill three. Again, the perceptual demands, what they have to do is too great and difficult. For that learner, their one objective is to get the ball in the ring. Worrying about the other demands of that complex skill um, is too, too great for that learner. So an elite netball is expected to get a score of nine out of 10 for, for drill three. Is this expectation too difficult in relation to the task? Um, hang on, let's go back here. The high, the high level, uh, the high level learner has a high competency in the technique of shooting. This allows them to spend more time in the areas such as tactics. So, if we're looking at cognitive learners, um, they can't do the tactical side, where the autonomous learners are going to be able to, to take in the, the relevant stimulus, use their selective attention, and then have consistent execution of those skills. Okay. So, what you need to do now is answer the questions on two. 
10 and 2.11, so pause and do them, and then rejoin the presentation. So the second concept is looking at practice and feedback. So what we want to do is uh, differentiate the types of practice and understand the relationship between the practice, the types of learners, and the performance. So um, within that, we want to look at the feedback that's involved in those types of practice and then understand the application of different types of feedback and their characteristics and understand that function of feedback within that skill learning model. So... Practice involves many things, so it's a rehearsal of activity or behaviour with the goal of improving or mastering it. So the components that we're looking at are the instructing, so information about what we do, the demonstrating, so that visual of seeing how we do it, applying it, so practising what we're doing, and then confirming what we've done, so that information about the process or the progress and the feedback delivered. So what are the types of practice? So there's a number of types of practice or me of methods used, and they're based on the different situations um, in those um, skill learning, so open or closed, as well as the level of that learner. So we can see here the closed skill of the golf swing, where the, the golf is hitting the ball off the tee, and that's a, a, um, a, a self-paced thing, so internally paced, where the open skill of that cricketer hitting hitting the shot um, relies a lot on external factors, you know, where the bowl is bowling, um, all those sorts of things. So we have um, fixed practice here. So this practice involves drills, and the drills are repeatedly practiced in the quest to master the movements, and the type of practice is, is used best for discrete closed skills. So something like um, hitting a golf shot, fixed practice where it's very repetitive, um, and we're looking specifically at those discrete skills. Then we have a mass practice. So that looks at um, the continuous form of practice best used for simple skills or continual repetition of that component skill in needed in the game. So um, the example here they give is professional tennis players spending 30 minutes practicing their backhand to correct a technique problem. Um, and that technique um, also focuses uh, focuses uses also a technique used to produce fatigue in a player to reinforce develop focus in, in conditions for a game. However, in a mass practice, you're not going to get, um, you know, say 30 continuous backhand shots. So it's used to develop technique um, under fatigue conditions, but then we'd use other practice to put it into a game situation. So then we have um, our variable practice. So this practice involves repeated, repeating in skill and changeable dynamic environment. Um, it's essentially these changes reflect those found when skills or techniques are used in a game. So this type of practice is commonly used in sports because it develops the flexibility involved in the skill execution needed in games. Um, and then we finally have our distributed practice. So like um, in part three, it's one of the more common and popular forms of practice. So we have our mass that we looked at in the previous and we have our distributed so it's essentially looking at the skill in blocks of time followed by blocks of rest so it might be looking at you know a serve um, followed by some backhands followed by some forehands followed by some volleys so it's breaking up and distributing the different skills across one practice session So looking at this case study here, two students were given the task of throwing a ball underarm at a target four metres away. Um, each score was given a score out of five with a bullseye getting a five out of ring one. So both had to complete 50 throws with an average score each being recorded. So a player A did 50 throws without a break, while player B did 10 throws followed by a two minute break five times, and then they graphed their scores. So let's look at the questions. Identify the student that used mass practice method. So if we're looking at somebody that did 50 throws without a break, they're more likely to have spent that mass time looking at that practice method. They say player B there, but they talk about the 50 throws without a break, so it's break, which is actually player A. Um, identify the practice method which produced the best results. So the 10 followed by the two-minute break um, with, uh, with two-minute break five times, so that distributed practice. And the reason being the two-minute break allowed to rest to avoid fatigue. 
So the two-minute break allowed the performer to get feedback and then reflect on what they were doing. So they could um, analyse, you know, what sort of technique they were using to to get if they, say, got a five-pointer, then they could go back and review and whatever. State which the task is fixed or variable. So it's a fixed task. Um, there was no change in the, start, the task that the students had performed, so it was a very controlled environment. All right, so looking at feedback. So what, what is feedback used like? That learning processing model that we use with our input, decision-making, output, and then feedback. Feedback's very important to be able to refine technique. So without feedback, we actually can't progress with our skill learning. So it's an information the skill performer, regardless of the learning stage or level, receives about what they've done with the skill execution. So um, it's important in refining the procedural knowledge involved in the skill execution, the knowledge of knowing what to do and how to do it. So feedback has three key functions. That first one of that reinforcement of learning. So it acts as positive reinforcement for good performance, but it also looks at and enables it the athlete to have motivation so to be able to look at key facets of the performance consistently and improve poor facets so it allows us to set little goals within there as well and meet those goals um, changes immediate performance so information leads to immediate improvement which again links back to that motivational factor so feedback can be delivered at a number of points in relation to skill performance so prior to skill execution during the skill execution and post the skill execution So we can see that feedback also needs to be meaningful. So if it's too detailed or too difficult for the learner to understand, um, it can be it can impact ne negatively on the performance. And if it is limited, it can be meaningless or no value, for, of no value. So if you know if somebody said to you, um, you need to do that better without any key performance indicators or key technique modifications, then it's really of no value, is it? Same as if somebody was giving a cognitive um, learner detailed feedback about their um, their running patterns in a game of junior soccer. It's too difficult for them to understand. They need things that are specific to the to their needs or to their levels. Beginners need prescriptive feedback, so they need to be told what was wrong and how to correct it. But it needs to be done in a positive way. Otherwise, again, that that um, skilled performer can lose motivation. Experienced performers need descriptive feedback. They need to be made aware or told of the outcome of what has been given to them. So we can see there it becomes in, uh, comes in a number of forms. So I'll just go through the sub um, subtitles and then you can um, subsections and you can read through um, the details. So the continuous, the internal, the negative, and the knowledge of results. Then we have the terminal, external, positive, and the knowledge of performance. So we can see um, the main ones there that will relate to our actual execution of skills internally um, would be that knowledge of results. So we know that um, the, the skill has been performed um, correctly or not. And then that knowledge of performance can come externally from the coaches to be able to then refine the technique. So we can see there using the letters C and A, we can know where we can use those different types of feedback. So for example, knowledge of results simply cannot be used. Um, uh, yeah. So remember a number of factors that affect the feedback use. So the cognitive development of the learner, the emotional development of the learner, the personality of the learner, the motivation of the learner, the learner's knowledge of the task. The coach's ability to demonstrate is very important. Um, that means that if we have video, computer, data, starter stats available to provide feedback, obviously the more detailed feedback for that autonomous learner, the better it's going to be. So just last case study on skill execution. High school students were given a task of taking 10 free throws, each was giving a two minute rest after each free throw. The difference between the students was the type of feedback provided, as you can see in the graph um, below. So we had knowledge of results and then knowledge of results and performance. So if we're looking at the two different, uh, explain the difference between the two different feedback types, one focuses on results and one focuses on the process. So we can see the one focus on the process was a lot more effective. Um, so 
now you need to pause and go to page 214 to 217 and complete those questions there before we move on.